Bibles to the Ephesians. Out of respect and adoration for the Lord and His Word, I'd ask you to stand and and before I read verse 22 down through chapter 6, verse 9, let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the reading and preaching of his word. Our Father in heaven, we come now to your most precious word, a saving word, a sanctifying word, a word that is able to bring us to glory. And we pray, Father, that this word be, would be brought that way into our lives, that it would be a revealing, healing, Lord, edifying word for us who know the Lord Jesus. And if there be anyone here this day, this morning, that know not Christ, that it would be a saving word to them. It would be a word that comes in power in drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ and establishing them in your most glorious and precious kingdom. So, Lord, now bless this word to your elect. Bless this word this morning to this church, this body, and all who might hear and benefit, Lord, from its message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to begin reading at verse 22 of chapter 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband." Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as man pleasers, but as slaves to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And thus ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, this morning we are embarking upon a new section in the book of Ephesians. The section that I just read for you addresses relationships, Christian relationships. In fact, it addresses particularly 
three kinds of relationships. We see in verse 22 down through verse 33, Paul addresses Christian marriage, the relationship of husband and wife. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, he addresses two other kinds of relationship. First, he addresses children and parents, and then servants and masters. Paul wants us, as he wanted Ephesus and those Christians in Ephesus to know that our faith governs our relationships. And this is highly important even in the 21st century. Think about your life. It's all made up of relationships. What is it about your life that does not have a relationship attached to it? We're all members of some family. We have some connection to someone somewhere. Even if we're not married, we, have, we may have a father or a mother or an uncle, an aunt. We have cousins. If we don't have any particular family left, we have those others that we sort of view as brothers and sisters. I, I hear people all the time talk about my brother, but they're not talking about the physical brother. They're talking about a very close friend. If we're married, we have um, a spouse. We have another set of family members that is connected to the spouse. If we have any kinds of relationships in the community, particularly even in the workplace, notice how in our work environments, it's set up in relationships. I mean, this section of Scripture pretty much hits us from every angle. Paul is addressing these relationships from the Christian perspective. I mean, this is not the only relationships that exist. I mean, in Romans, Paul dealt with the church and state. He's not dealing with that here. Peter addressed what it was like for a woman to possibly live with an unbelieving husband. Paul is not addressing that here. Paul did address something similar to that in the book of Corinthians, but Paul is not addressing that in this epistle. Paul is setting uh, up in this epistle how Christians ought to live with Christians. And that's why you see in the bulletin the title Christian Marriage. We're not addressing marriage from a general perspective from the world's perspective. We're not addressing what it's like for a Christian to be married to an unbeliever or any of those things. Or we're not addressing unbelievers in marriage. We're addressing Christians in marriage. And this is important. It's important because as Christians, we have made promises to the Lord, haven't we? We've made promises to the Lord when we when we, brought, when we were brought into the membership of the church, we made promises. We took vows and we said that we, we, we promised before the Lord and before the congregation that we would live like Christians. That we would live lives as becometh of Christians. That we would, as Christians, study Christ. Walk according to his example. That we would be dedicated to discipleship. That we would be dedicated to aiding and uh, uh, helping the church grow numerically and spiritually. That we would study the peace and the purity of the church. That, that we would live, I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, we'd live like Christians. Whether we be male or female, young or old, husbands or wives, parents or children, single or married, it doesn't matter that we would, in our respective places, live like Christians. That we would study the faith, be committed to it, 
to seeing the faith born out in our respective relationships. That's where we are. That we would be so committed to following Jesus Christ that we would see Christ's likeness born out in all of our relationships and in our perspective duties to one another. One of my goal in addressing these relationships and particularly to introduce it this morning um, is to really point us to what discipleship really is as related to counseling, so to speak. Um, you know, you get to these passages of Scripture and sort of a switch goes off. And we, we sort of see these passages as aiding us from a counseling perspective. But there's a couple of things I want to help you understand is that these passages are not necessarily, necessarily addressing techniques or methods. Now, they, they do address a method. They certainly give us some substance and direction. But there's, there's, there's something lacking even in verses 22 and 33 from a technical counseling perspective is Paul doesn't lay out a whole list of techniques to aid the Christian in his marriage or her marriage. Why? Because, beloved, you cannot improve your marriage through techniques. That's the philosophy or that's the... Um, that's the basic philosophy of psychology. If we practice certain techniques, we can improve ourselves. We can, if we practice these techniques individually, we'll make personal improvement. If we practice these techniques in our homes, we will have an improved marriage. If we practice these techniques, and that's why the bookstores are filled with manuals. That's why the Christian bookstore is filled with manuals because of the influence of psychology in the church. You see, Paul does not do that. Paul is drawing us and has drawn us to Christ. Paul understands that the, the greatest thing that we, uh, are, the most important thing that we must be fixated upon is not necessarily the technique, but upon the Lord himself. Focusing our attention, our gaze, our motivation, our desires, and our affections, not toward our problems, but toward Jesus, his glory. Communion, companionship with him. And the more we conform to that glorious Christ through his word, through the influence and filling of the Holy Spirit, the more our marriages reflect this heavenly nature. You see, you cannot perform certain techniques to, well, be blessed with this heavenliness. No amount of techniques is going to... Uh, they are going to secure for you the benediction of Jesus in your marriage. It's not going to happen. See, Jesus is not concerned about you psychologizing the gospel and making it somewhat humanistic. He doesn't bless that. He's concerned about you conforming to him, being filled with the Spirit being filled with the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit of truth, being filled with the Word of God, having your mind and your, your affections conform to His standard of holiness in His law, you growing in sanctification, holiness. 
So I, I have to say that. Because at the heart of what we're talking about here is whether or not we will trust the word of God over the word of Freud. Skinner, pop psychologist, the, the latest and greatest evangelistic guru of the day. Will we trust God's word Will we see it as sufficient to improve our marriages, to improve our parenting, to improve our uh, social um, relationships, uh, slaves and, and masters? Will we see, do we see, will we see, will we repent of if we don't see that God's word, sola scriptura, is sufficient? And what do we mean by the sufficiency of the Word of God? Well, it means, beloved, that what God has revealed to us about any given topic that it reveals is completely only what we need to grow us up in holiness and righteousness. You see, it's not a manual. The Bible's not a manual. The Word of God's a revelation. It's an unveiling of God's will, God's glory, God's wisdom, God's character, God's nature, God's plan. It's a revelation that has been played out in the annals of history with God's people where we see his power, where we see his love, where we see his nurturing, where we see his, his zeal and where we see his jealousy for his people and where we see how he conquers evil, how he conquers those uh, tyrants, how he puts them under his feet, but how the church remains victorious because she's in communion with him and she and she alone receives his benediction. You want God's benediction in your relationships, don't you? You want God's benediction in your marriage, husbands and wives. Children, you want God's benediction on you. As you grow up in a home, parents, you want God's benediction. You want God's benediction as you get out here in your work in the relationships of, of bosses and employees and employers. You got to live by the word of God. You have to live by the every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So these, these areas... Beloved, I'm not going to approach them and say, well, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to have this blessed marriage. It doesn't work that way. Because, see, the Lord doesn't bless just activity. The Lord doesn't bless outward conformity to his law. If that was the case, he would have blessed the Pharisees. Jesus would not have called them open sepulchers. Full of dead men's bones, whitewashed sepulchers. They look good on the outside, but on the inside is crud and death. You see, we must reject and deny that techniques are going to save our marriage, improve our marriage, make it better. And we must understand that it's Christ that makes the marriage better. It's Christ that makes parenting better. It's Christ that makes all of these other relationships better. And the more we conform to him, the better those relationships are going to be. What's the um, goal, if you will, of... Um, well, let's, let's look. I want to show you something about these relationships, and then we're going to talk a little bit about marriage this morning. First of all, notice that in these relationships, Paul has sort of introduced them, I, I think from verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, what this verse does not mean is that there are, there's no authority figures in the world. 
This verse does not teach that there's no authority. This verse does not teach that everybody's equal. It rejects the idea, if we rightly understand it, of egalitarianism. Egalitarianism is that is a society of everybody's equal in everything and in all places, and there's no superiors, there's no inferiors, and everybody is equal. We don't believe that. We believe that in the society structure that God has set up in the earth is made up of three categories, superiors, inferiors, and equals. Now, that is taught and exposited in the uh, fifth commandment. These relationships set that paradigm up for us. Notice verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Paul affirms that there is in the marriage a paradigm of authority. The man is the head and the wife is his helpmeet. She is to submit. He is to lead. What a very unpopular idea today. You may not recognize this, and you may not believe it if you do recognize it, but we live in a very feministic society, a, a society dominated by feminism. And it's everywhere. And it's in the church. And when you read passages like this, there is a tendency to reinterpret it. To sort of wipe, erase the God-ordained structure of superiors, inferiors, and equals and to replace it with some cultural, cultural innovation, some new cultural idea. Because... We are actually evolutionist, and we believe that somehow society has evolved to a place where these old paradigms of authority should be seen as not only inadequate, but evil. And if you are a woman and you are in a marriage relationship and you actually believe that you should be submissive to your husband, you are a victim of wrong thinking and bad ideas. And you need to be liberated from that idea. And that's why many of the feminists, who do they attack in the Bible? Paul. They hate Paul. They call him a, you know, a, 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 a um, I can't even think of the word, but they call him a woman hater. But even though there's a better word for it, they go right after Paul. They cannot stand the Apostle Paul. And, they, um, and so they'll point things like that out. But what I want you to understand, beloved, that in this structure, as Paul begins to address the Christian marriage and the paradigm that God has established for this marriage, notice that there is a, a, a headship, there is a help meet, there's going to be a submissiveness, and there's going to be a leading that's going to take place in the, in the marriage. Now look at the children and parent relationship. Notice, children obey your parents. Now we have a relationship that the mom and dad are equal in, in duty of raising the children in the admonition and nurture of the Lord. Though the man is the head of the home. The wife has just as much obligation and duty to see her children grow in nurture and admonition and Christian education and character in the Lord as the male does. And the children are to see both mom and dad as authority figures. And that's why in Leviticus, when uh, Moses wrote and he said, um, children, obey your mother and your father, it was staggering in that culture because the Holy Spirit changed the word order. The Holy Spirit placed the mother first in that relationship and says, hey, showing the dignity of the mother 
showing the honor that the mother must receive from her children in establishing her in the order, in the first order. Children, obey your mother and your father. Now, in other places, it says father and mother. But the Holy Spirit is showing us something. The Holy Spirit is showing us that both father and mother have dignity and should be honored by the parent, uh, by the children. Just as the slaves must submit to their masters. In each of these relationships, notice Christ is central. Look at what it says in verse 22. I didn't read it a while ago. The end of it. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Why should a wife be subject to her husband? Because the husband demands it? No. Because that's culturally acceptable? No. Culture doesn't dictate what we do. Because she does it as unto the Lord. Because he commands it. He's the head. You see... In each one of these relationships, who stands at the head of the relationship? Jesus. See, the husband, though he be the head of the wife, still has a head over him. Jesus. Just as the parents are the authority figures over the children, the parents are going to give an answer to whom? The Lord. That's why they ought to nurture and discipline and raise up the children in the Lord. What about the master who may be tempted to treat illy his servant? Who's his master? The Lord. So you see the accountability structure in all of these relationships. You see the true focus and the true head is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, why should a wife be submissive? Because she loves Jesus Christ. Why should the husband love his wife as his own body? Because he loves Jesus Christ. Why should the parents raise their children up with a Christian education in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Because the parents love Jesus Christ. Why should the children submit to their parents? Because the children love Jesus Christ. Why does a master not abuse and take advantage of and treat illy his servant? Because the master loves Jesus Christ. And why should the servant be concerned from a heart perspective that he not just offer eye service, but that he do his work as unto the Lord? Because he loves Jesus Christ. No technique is ever going to replace our love and affection and devotion to Jesus. That doesn't mean that you can't practice some things and appear to get really good results. I mean, if you men, I mean, if your wife tells you, I really wish you would just tell me you love me every now and then. You know, it might be nice as I'm raising these children. So some, you know, some flowers might be nice every now and then. Maybe, some, you know, maybe just some acknowledgement for what I do. So when you begin to practice that outwardly, let's say men in your hearts, you could care less. You see that as nagging. You see that as complaining. And she's not appreciative of what you do. But you're going to do what she says. And that might, might or it might appear, let's just put it that way, it would appear to bring peace in the home, but it will not be true peace. It will, not, it will not get the benediction of Jesus Christ because you're not doing it as unto the Lord. You're not changing from the inside out. You're not loving your wife. because uh, You're not letting your love for the Lord influence your love for your wife. And it'll be a reflection. Listen, my last comment, and we're going to look at some things in particular. When a, when a wife does not want to submit to her husband, she is exhibiting a rebellion against Christ. She's not being submissive to him. When a husband fails 
to love his wife according as Christ loved the church, he's exhibiting his hatred for Christ, his rebellion against Christ. When parents don't raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord in a Christian setting, they are exhibiting their hatred for Christ. When children do not honor and reverence their parents, they are not honoring and reverence Christ. They're proving they hate him. Now, you say, oh, I don't hate him. Well, we can do something about that. Same way with masters and slaves now. And I pointed out to you Wednesday night, let's look at one passage of Scripture to establish this, and then we're going to look at some particulars. Go to Exodus 20. We're going to look at a verse we looked at in our Bible study on the law. We're going to look at the second commandment. Look at chapter 20. And look at verse 4. We're going to look at the second commandment. Because in this commandment, we are, we are going to establish that as the, the head of the house goes, as the authority figure goes, so do the children. Okay? You shall not make for yourself any, an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath are in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and four, in the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. The Hebrew here is clearer in verse 5 when it says that I am a jealous God. When God says, you shall not worship them, these idols, these false gods. You're not going to worship them. You're not going to bow down to them. I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God. I'm, I'm passionate. I am zealous for your worship. But what happens when the father's hearts turn away from God? He says that he visits the iniquity. That word iniquity in Hebrew is the word hatred. When a man doesn't follow God's law, he's expressing hatred to God. When a man refuses to worship God as he dictates worship, as he has prescribed worship, man is exhibiting a rebellious heart and mind and says, no, I'm going to worship God the way I want to. That's hatred. And God says he visits the iniquity of the fathers, the hatred of the fathers onto the children. Why? Because the children begin to exhibit and put into more practice the hatred the father exhibits. Let me, let me give you an example. A professing Christian professes to know God, professes to love God, yet he does not raise his children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He, he lets the world disciple his children. He lets MTV, the Simpsons, the TV to disciple the children, to inform the children of their ethics and morals. He lets the world and the culture around them give their, his children this paradigm of right and wrong because he doesn't have any real place for that or the capacity that the mom is more interested in her peace than her dealing with the children. I, I, I see it many, many times. It's grievous. And I, I've talked to so many women that will make a comment about their children and they'll say, I just can't wait till they go back to school. I mean, I've had them for a week. Uh, they don't realize that they are exhibiting a hatred for God. And God says this will not go unnoticed. This will not go without punishment because as this household grows up under this superficiality of professing to know God and to you know, believe in this God, maybe go to church at Christmas, maybe go to church at Easter, the two most important days of the year. The children have nothing more than a synchronized humanism. They have a humanism that's sprinkled with some Christian terminology, and they may say they love the Lord too, but yet they go out and they live as the world lives. 
and the Lord chastens them and he punishes them. Notice the, the context of the commandment. The children on through the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. How do we prove we hate the Lord? We don't obey him. We don't obey him. Well, I'm not going to church. You know, I don't have to go to church to worship God. I don't have to be a church member. I don't have to read my Bible. I know what's right. Oh, you're, you're your own God. That's hatred. Your autonomy is hatred. I don't need all of that to get to heaven. Your autonomy is hatred because God has revealed to you, oh man and oh woman, what is right in his sight and you're rejecting it. Commandment makes clear it's those who do these things or those who hate him. But he says in verse 6, but show, verse six, showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. What's the test? What's our um, surety for loving God? Obeying him. That's why the wife must be submissive. In what? All things that are lawful. That's why the husband must be the head. That's why he must lead and nurture. He must grow in grace. He must be concerned about his headship. That's why parents must raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's why the children must honor and reverence their parents. That's why masters should not ever abuse their slaves. And the slaves should work for their masters as unto the Lord. They shouldn't have to be watched by their masters. I'm going to get over here and smoke a cigarette and kill about 30, 40 minutes every time nobody's looking. And the wasting of time. You know, there's a, a great study, and I'll bring this out at that point in time, where, you know, when you're talking about an eight-hour work day, you know how many hours they technically really work in the day they figured out? Only about three. Three. So out of the eight hours... Work. By the time you go to the bathroom, by the time you stop and talk, by the time you take your lunch, by the time you take your breaks, by the time you walk. I, it's like I, I saw, uh, I was standing outside a, a tool place and, and uh, this, this uh, corporate truck drove up, had the emblems and stuff on the side, and the guy got out and he walked in like this, to, the, to, the, to the building. I, I mean, it really took him like 10 or 15 minutes to walk 100 feet. He was not in a hurry. He was not in a hurry to get back. And I, I, I just sat there laughing, watching this guy, big, healthy, burly guy, but he had enough muscles to carry the truck to the, to the building. It wasn't a matter of ability. It was a matter of heart. He was wasting time and wasting his employer's money. All right. So let's go back to Ephesians 5. All right. What's the goal of Christian marriage? Well, the goal of Christian marriage is the same goal that all of us should have as individual Christians, and that is the goal of our Christian marriage should be to glorify God and to enjoy him in the marriage covenant, particularly. That is, as, as husband and wife, the duty of the marriage covenant is to bring glory to to God and to enjoy the Lord in the covenant relationship. Now, why is this goal important to keep in mind? Because anything less, anything less than a focus on God's glory and enjoyment is human-centered and humanism. It's man-centered and humanism. Anything less than God's glory. Anything less breaks the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. See, if you get married just because you have urges that need to be satisfied, that's not a good reason. That may be one. It's not a good reason. The goal of marriage is in the covenant of intimacy that the husband and wife bring ultimate glory to God that they could not do as single people. The first commandment demands this. But what does it mean, this goal in the Christian home? What does it look like? Let's talk about that. Well, first of all, 
A home that is glorifying God and enjoying him will not be a home that is perfected. We can't be perfected in the covenant of grace. It'll be at the end of time. It'll be when Jesus comes back that we will be glorified and perfected or until we go to glory itself. But that home is under the headship of Christ. That's what it means. If your marriage is glorifying God, what we're saying is you are under the headship of Christ. He's the boss. He's the head. That's why I've always said, you know, there's this, this, this idea, you know, I'm the king of my castle. You know, the Archie Bunker, is that too old? I mean, we don't even know who Archie Bunker is anymore. Well, I don't know who would be the, the, the modern day Archie Bunker, but... Uh, Bundy, is that his name? On uh, All in the Children or something like that? You know, the guy that's just a, a, a slouch. He works because he has to. He complains about it all the time. He comes home. The wife is, I mean, she's all concerned about herself. And these children have just ruined me. I just want to do, I just want to be liberated. But I'm married to this bum. And he's married to her. And he doesn't like that. But they have to get along. They can't afford to separate. Too many tax advantages remain married. That's the idea that so many have. It's not, going, it's not going to be a perfected home, but it's going to be a home that rests comfortably and is satisfied with the headship of Jesus Christ. We are not the king of our castles, men. Jesus is the king of our castles. Jesus is the head of our home. That's why when we treat illy our wives, we're convicted and should be. When we mistreat our children, we're convicted. Christ as head of the home means this. As mediator, he is the prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, he instructs. What is he doing right now? He's teaching us that women must learn to be submissive to bring God glory and that men must learn to nurture and love to bring God glory. As a priest, he heals our sins he heals our consciences when we lash out at our wife when our wife lashes out at the husbands and he's our priest he comes and he forgives us and he heals us and he ministers to us the graces we need he's our king he's not just our sovereign but he's working in us he's killing our enemies our greatest enemies are ourselves He's mortifying our desires. That is, as we obey him and give ourselves over to the means of grace, to preaching of the word of God, to prayer as we spend time on our knees pleading to God for understanding and grace. Well, he does that. He gives it. It's a home determined first and foremost to be subjected to the will of God. Does your home reflect that? And this may upset the children. Some of the old children say, oh, man, my mom. You know, my dad and my mom, they're just religious fanatics. The tendency is to cool mom and dad down. Don't take Jesus so seriously. Look at all these other people. They're Christians too. They love the Lord. And the parents end up changing the paradigm of the home and submitting to the child. It happens all the time. In order to keep peace with the children, the father submits to the child. In order to keep peace, the mother's tired of arguing. She submits to the child. That's why we see so many monstrous children running around. What's happened in the home? Well, it's not Christian. It's not Christian. It's a home determined to submit to the will of God. It's a home that, that, that is glad to be under the influences of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, under his discipleship, under his graces. It is thankful to be under his influence and headship. It's a home that's thankful. How many times have you thanked the Lord for his teaching? Teaching you. His forgiveness. His graces. And his kingship. Hey, how many times has he protected you from yourself? It's a home 
This Christian home, beloved, is a home that's dedicated to the glory and enjoyment of God is a home under his benediction. It's a home under the benediction of the prophet, priest, and king, his promises, his blessings. That if this home will be submissive to me, I will bless you. As the husband, as the wife seeks this in this marriage covenant, as they seek to submit to the will of Jesus Christ, Jesus, from the heart, Jesus blesses us. You know, the world is certainly confused about marriage, and that's understandable, but the church shouldn't be. There's a lot of confusion among evangelicals about what marriage should even look like. Now, we just talked about the goal of marriage, but what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose of it? There are many purposes to marriage. The goal certainly is to glorify and enjoy God in this covenant of companionship, which means we are always should be growing in it. Not apart, but together. And remember, husbands and wives, it's a covenant of companionship. Friendship. Friendship. In fact, turn with me to Genesis 2. I'm not going to rush this. Um, I'm not going to try to get through a bulk of material. We'll just pick up next week where we leave off. But I want us to see something in Genesis 2. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. And then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And I'll make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see that he, what he would call them and whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place and the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. What does this text teach us? Some of the most important things that we need to hear in our day and time is that this text teaches us and is sufficient to show us as man was given the mandate of subduing the earth, bringing the whole earth under the dominion of God's glory, he created for man a woman, not another man. Not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. You see, the, the paradigm here is clear. God's wisdom is being expressed and exposed and revealed in that Adam had no suitable, com, com, uh, so appropriate, suitable helper, a companion. And God made for Adam out of his side a woman. This companionship and relationship would be so intimate and so powerful, uh, Adam prophesies, for this reason a man will leave his basic loving relationships of mom and dad and, be a, uh, and attach himself to his wife and become a new family. That's what Adam prophesied. When Adam said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. And for this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. What he was saying is this relationship will be so good, so wholesome, so intimate, so powerful, this man will leave the, the safety and the comfort and the blessing of his own home and attach himself to the woman and she to him. This tells us not only the most perfect companion for man in this dominion mandate was woman and not another man, it also tells us 
beloved, that the marriage covenant is a permanent relationship and the parent and child is not. The wisdom of Paul in addressing marriage, parenting, and slaves and masters is interesting. The most permanent, most important relationship is the marriage. The second most important relationship in the home is the parent and child. And then the least most important, but it's still important, is the slave and master. As the marriage goes, so will everything else. Marriage is the foundation of every society. And what do we see in all godless societies? The breakdown of the home. The breakdown of marriage. Uh, let, me, let me show you. Turn to Leviticus. I'm just going to show you these, bulk, these larger passages, okay, so that you know. Look at Leviticus 18. Now, I'm going to point, I'm not going to read all of this because it might be embarrassing to you. There are some certainly embarrassing things revealed here, particularly in our culture. You know, we don't talk about certain things. Um, but notice chapter 18 of Leviticus are the laws addressing relationships, marriage, and who can be married, who cannot be married, uh, intimacy, who you should, who should be intimate and who should not be intimate. Now look at verse 24. Now do not defile yourselves by any of these things. That is, as he, as he gets to that place, he says, listen, all of these relate, these, these, these ill relationships, all of these abominations, all of these perversions in the relationships that I pointed out to you are, are important for you to understand. Don't defile yourself with them. Notice what he says. Do not defile yourself by any of these things. For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes, my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out, should you defile it, as it has spewed out the nations which have been before you. For whosoever does any of these abominations... Those persons who do so shall be cut off from among the people. Thus you are to keep my charge. Thus you are not to practice any of these abominable customs which have been practiced before you so as not to defile yourself with them. I am the Lord your God. You remember, what, you remember the comment I made about Lot and his daughters? That wasn't anything out of the ordinary. They practiced incest in Sodom. Canaan practiced in Look, these girls were enculturated with the world. Adam, uh, Adam, Lot failed his children. He didn't raise his children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He was a righteous man, the scriptures say, and his soul was vexed constantly, yet he failed his children and he lost his girls to the world, to the culture, to the godlessness, to the abominations that they lived in. And they were just doing what the world did. See, these relationships matter. Paul's going back to these relationships and he says, listen, you got to have Christian marriages here. What do we need to understand about these Christian marriages in our day and time? Well, first of all, the only lawful marriage, and we just read it, Genesis 2, the only lawful marriage is between a man and woman. Not a woman and woman and not a man and a man. The scriptures teach that lawful marriage is between one man and one woman. Not one man and many women or one woman and many men. It is between one man and one woman. And anything else we must reject. We must deny. Let me give you another application in our own perverted day. What does that do with about transsexuals? You know, that's another topic. 
What happens when men go through the process and operation to turn themselves into women? Because instead of Charlie, she should have been Charlotte. God doesn't make mistakes. They're still men, even though they look like women now. Even though they bear their own abomination physically in their bodies, they are not to marry a man. You see, the Bible answers these questions that so many Christians seem to be confused about. Secondly, scriptures teach us that marriage is for the work of the Lord. It's for the procreation of the human race. It's to raise up a, a holy seed. Turn to Malachi 2. What happens when Christians or believers begin to um, squander and waste God's heritage? What happens when Christians are no longer concerned about their children and they say, you know, just kind of let them, you know, kind of grow up and do their own thing? Well, the Lord hates it and he judges it. Now, let me say this about Christian education. I'll confirm this when we get to the area on children. The Bible says more about the manner of raising children than the, the method of educating them. Here's what I mean by that. The manner that we should must be dedicated to is Christian education, Christian discipleship, plain and simple. The method may be through a private school, private tutor. It might be through homeschooling. It might be through another co-op. The manner is the most important thing. Christian parents must be dedicated to Christian education, whatever the form. It is not biblical to say that the only form of education is, is home education. That's one of the several ways it can be done because the most important aspect of Christian education is what? That it's Christian that it exalts and honors God and his glory and sets apart his will as the will that we must conform to. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Now, look, let's back at verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is the, your companion and the wife by your covenant. Notice what verses 13 and 14 says. They come and the Lord's chastening them and they cry and they wail to the Lord. And Lord, why, why are you rejecting us? Lord, why are you chastening us? He says, because your marriages aren't right. You, you treat illy the companion of your youth your wife, and I reject your worship. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now you see what he says here? Oh, I mean, I mean divorce was rampant in Jesus' day. I mean, the wife burned the meal, divorce. She would actually just see the certificate, but divorce. See, it used to be they could just say, I divorce you. But then they said, okay, well, that's too easy. You got to write it out. You got to make it a little harder. So you, now you have to write them a certificate. And in evil societies and godless cultures, divorce is popular, it's rampant, and it's easy. Just like when God judged Israel, he says, I reject your worship. Let me ask you this. How much worship is being accepted in America? When divorce is just, an, you know, hey, marriage is nothing but a social contract. You know, I need you. You need me. Let's just hook up. Let's get together. Let's just, you know, take care of this thing. And 
well, get tired of each other. We just separate and go to somebody else. Get tired of them, get separate, go to somebody. And the, the land is defiled. Let me, I'm going to stop here because I'm going to point out something. Go back to Ephesians 5. Now, I'm going to spend some time unfolding this, okay? But, but why does the Lord take marriage so seriously? Well, look what Ephesians 5 teaches. Notice what it says. Verse 24. Or let's back up verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. And he gave himself, being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Or, but, uh, verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she should be holy and blameless. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the reason God hates the abuse of marriage and why God hates divorce. It doesn't mean it is because the picture of Christ and his church is seen in the marriage covenant. And when the, when the marriage covenant is abused, what kind of ill picture does that give of Christ and his church? When wives are not submissive to the husbands, I, I, you know, you, you kind of meet the idea, no, I'm submissive when I want to be. I'm submissive when I think I'm right, or, you know, when I, I'm right. I let him be the head because I let him be the head. He leads not because he's been created to lead and he loves the Lord, but he leads because, well, you know, I guess I, somebody's got to do it. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. You see, beloved, our marriages are pictures to the world of Christ and his church. What picture is American marriage given about the church? Well, we don't have to do what Jesus says because we don't believe in legalism. We don't have to submit because there's nothing to submit to. There's no law. And the only headship is the things we want to do. See, most men, most men aren't tyrants. Most men are lazy. And the man will let the woman lead if she exerts enough power. Because he doesn't want to fight more. More than often, the man is not a tyrant. He is just lazy. It's better to let her do what she wants to do so I don't have to hear her nag than to actually address it and to bring our home into subjection of king of glory. Brothers and sisters, we are stepping into some very good waters, interesting waters. We have the opportunity to really challenge our minds and our homes about some things. May we take heed to it, listen, learn, grow. May we take it seriously over the next several weeks. Let's pray. Now, Father, we have uh, looked into your word concerning relationships, but particularly marriage. And Father, we are in great need of humility and instruction. And Lord, we pray that you come and bless us. Lord, let the benediction upon us be that of, Lord, enlightenment and understanding and a willingness to submit to your authority. And Lord, I pray that our homes, our Christian, our marriages would even begin today to blossom that there would be a renewed vigor and interest 
in the, in the husband and wife, in the love of Christ, and that it would have a sanctifying, glorious effect upon all of the household, the children, the siblings, Lord, even in this church body. Lord, we pray that whether we are strong-willed, whether we're lazy, or whether we are just, Lord, feel ill-equipped, or whatever the case may be, draw us to yourself. Focus our attention and sight upon you. Lord, help us to drink deeply from the word of truth. And Lord, wean us off of pop psychology. Wean us off of the world and its feminism and, uh, Lord, and its ideas of uh, pleasure and all that, all the, the world's ideas about the home. Lord, wean us off of those things and help us to be witnesses of Christ in his church. We pray this in his name. Amen.